So hi, everyone. I'm Rachel. I um, am the host for today, along with Yaler. And we're both here with Panvala. Panvala is putting uh, put together this event, Crypto 102, for newbies to the space. And uh, today we'll be talking about safety and security, and like as well as... As well as, well as creating... Sorry, I just need to mute him really quick. Yeah, I'll call him. Someone's on a business meeting. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we talk about safety and security as well as creating your own wallet. Um, we walking through step by step. Okay, I'm just gonna step outside for a second. Everyone. Okay. Uh, yeah, I don't know how to do that on my phone. Sorry, I did mute everyone. Um, so uh, back to it. So we'll be. Talking about those things, there's a whole group of people here really to help. Um, so it's not just gonna be um, Yaler's voice or my voice, but lots of people helping us answer questions and get clarity on things. Um, just to say there are no dumb questions. This is for beginners. So um, don't feel like um, you can't ask any question you have. Feel free to utilize the chat, especially if someone's kind of going off on a subject. Um, if you don't wanna use the chat and you want to uh, ask a question, you can use a little hand raise. Uh, if you don't have that um, or you can't find that on Zoom, you can just use a little hand signal and uh, we'll call on you so you can ask your question. Um, I think that's it. Yaler, why don't you go ahead and begin? Yeah, thanks, Rachel. Um, so what I think we're wanting to focus on today is like really the questions that people have about like getting started in a space, um, getting set up with an Ethereum wallet and talking about security a little bit. I am not the expert in these manners, but you have a lot of really knowledgeable people here as well, from Kyle to Aaron to Puslar, um, who can kind of guide us through, answer questions as well. So this will be an interactive discussion with all the folks and anyone else who ha happens to pop in. Um, we're not here to give a curriculum, just to kind of respond to the needs of like the community um, and to answer those questions that are coming from people who are interested in finding out how to get involved. So that's, a, that's the starting point there. Um, the goal by the end of today is to, if anyone doesn't have an Ethereum wallet set up already, to get you set up with a wallet. And um, so maybe I can just ask really quick, is there anyone here who's never set up an Ethereum address and is interested in setting up a wallet for themselves? Me. <laughs> okay, awesome, no worries. Um, great, we can do that. We can do that. Um, give me just a second. I'm just going to open the chat. Okay, cool. Um, great. So I'm going to jump back over to my document really quick. Um, so Ethereum is decentralized. And what decentralized means is that it's uh, run and owned by the users of the network. So when you set up an Ethereum wallet, an Ethereum address, the only backups or security that you have are the original seed phrase keys that are given to you. That is a string of 12 words that basically, it's like your password. It's a universal password that allows you to bring your Ethereum wallet back up on any device that you happen to have it loaded onto. So that could be a computer, that could be your cell phone, that could be a tablet or something like that. And the cool thing about Ethereum wallets is you can log in to your wallet through multiple different devices. And in case one of your devices gets lost, stolen, or it falls into the ocean, you can still have access to all your account um, on, on another address. That's why it's really important when you set up your wallet to save your key phrase. So they talk about security a lot. Um, not ever giving your key phrase away to anyone is also a really important. There's a lot of kind of nebulous activity out there of people um, trying to trick you into giving you key phrases. Uh, unfortunately, we're still dealing with a lot of this kind of like scammer tactics at this point. 
Um, and you have to kind of be aware of that going into it, that, you know, use your wits um, and don't give away information to people that uh, are not fully verified, basically. And under no conditions would you ever give anyone your key phrase or your private keys um, to your wallet. Because if they have that information, they can take all of your funds out of your wallet. Um, yeah, key phrase equals seed phrase. So when you set up a wallet, and can I screen share, Rachel? Can you uh, give me permission to screen share? And that way I can, um, sure. Yeah, we're gonna get the screen share set up just a sec. So what I'm gonna do is gonna show you uh, MetaMask wallet. What it, what it. <laughs> uh, so I'm gonna drop the link in the channel. So anyone who's on their computer, can actually go to this website link that I just dropped in the chat. Um, dun, dun. So I'll do it with you. Um, now I already have MetaMask set up on my wallet basically. So for me, it's, uh, it's just gonna be a, um, a repeat of what's already been done, but here we'll share the screen anyway. So sharing screen. All right, so if you're going to this website, MetaMask, uh, MetaMask is basically just a wallet generator. So it means it allows you to create your own wallet um, with this software. So depending on what browser that you're using, your MetaMask um, wallet lives inside of your browser. It's like an extension on Chrome or iOS or Android, depending on what operating system. So you go ahead and click MetaMask and you install it in your computer. You run the setup um, and I can do it, but I don't need to because I already have it installed. It's going to end up right over here in the top right hand corner. You'll see this little fox. It's really cute. Actually, like it follows you around before you're logged in. Um, and when you first open it up, it'll give you these kind of like prompts to save your seed phrase and everything. So you wanna make sure you save that on your computer and that you have that information. You, you can even write it down as well and put it in a safe place because that, like I said, is your password um, to your account forevermore. Um, so it's important to remember that. Um, I'm just looking at the questions really quick just to see. Do, 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 do. So, oh, someone asked about exchange wallets. So. There's a difference between a custodial wallet and a non-custodial wallet. What that means is a custodial wallet is where like you have an exchange like Coinbase or Kraken or any of these places where you would sell tokens uh, in a marketplace. A custodial wallet means they, the company who owns that exchange, they have access to that wallet. So they hold your private keys for you which is not the most safe and secure way to hold on to your cryptocurrency. It is an okay way when you want to um, sell your tokens to put it in there. But when I go to like coinbase.com, this is another website and I, you should be able to see. So when I go to Coinbase, um, it's basically gonna log me in. It's gonna give me an account and I'm gonna register and everything with them. But I never send more money to my Coinbase account. Oh my gosh, Bitcoin's 57,000. <laughs> it's crazy. Uh, I never put more money in my Coinbase account than I'm going to sell. So I don't hold on to my cryptocurrencies in my Coinbase account because what can happen is if this company or this organization somehow is hacked and the data that they have is, is exposed to the internet, those private keys can be shared with people who want to take your funds and they can then um, strain the funds from your account. Pasar? Uh, yes, I, I wanna mention two other concerns with Coinbase or Binance and others. Uh, another concern would be legalities, like they, they could ban a country and say, okay, people from this country cannot cash out for, for some reason at this point in time. The other thing is that uh, it happened to Coinbase or I think Binance as well, like at some point they, they had too many, uh, too much demand and said, okay, we, we're locked for a day or two and no one can like uh, play with their cryptos held in our uh, accounts 
for a day or two for like uh, th th there has been a, uh, a technical problem or something but it, it this could never happen with you owning a, a wallet of your own yes that's a very good point Disc uh, censorship is a really important key to this whole thing so metamask wallets non-custodial wallets cannot be censored they they can't be banned from any country or any region and there's no regulatory agency that can enforce. I mean, if you are setting one up on your computer, it's yours. It belongs to you. Your tokens will always be there. They're stored on the, the information is stored in the Ethereum blockchain. But any company, any organization who has a headquarters in a country can, for any reason, be A, forced to stop those deposits or withdrawals, or can choose to um, stop payouts on certain things for any particular reason. And I think it's quite relevant because we just saw this happen with the whole Robin Hood thing in the US where GameStop stock was going through the roof and people were buying and selling. And it was so bad for Robin Hood, the company, they stopped trading altogether. Now that I, to me is just like the most malicious business practice you could ever have. I don't think you should ever stop people from taking, you know, using a service on a platform, but Ethereum, especially non-custodial wallets kind of salt solves that. That's why decentralized exchanges like Uniswap are much better for users than centralized exchanges like Coinbase or uh, Binance or BitMEX. And there is thousands of exchanges. So just be aware that that's kind of a, a thing you have to wade through as well. But yeah, so that's why I encourage people to set up your own non-custodial wallet because you can hold all your tokens in there and you can go to exchanges when it's relevant, when you want to sell into your local currency or when you want to buy into something else. Um, but that way you always have control of your funds and you don't have to worry about um, kind of being censored or uh, having some malicious stuff happen that's out of your control. Um, yeah, so that's a relevant point. Joseph? Yeah, I just wanted maybe someone could more eloquently than I speak to, but I think just in context, when we compare like having a bank account with U.S. Bank or Bank of America, for example, as to being within a custodial wallet like Coinbase or Gemini, like that there are more similarities there other than um, how I see it is that like, because I feel like what we're sharing is really technical, but like on a simple level, like having your stuff shared on Coinbase is, is, is in a way more dangerous as I understand than having it in like Bank of America, which is your a custodial as well, but just, it seemed helpful to maybe- Wait, 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 like, you said Bank of America. I, I'm not, I'm If confused. you have your money in Bank of America, someone mm -hmm. could steal money from Bank of America or they could be hacked, for example, just as much as Gemini could. So the, um, the, the, the difference, and, and yeah, you're very correct. But the difference is if your funds are hacked through a Gemini or through a Coinbase, they're not liable to pay you back any of those funds. Same thing with any Ethereum wallet. Um, if someone gets into your account, that's why your security and safety is really, really key to this whole thing is you're in control, you're in charge of your funds under these things. But if your money is stolen from a bank, FDIC insurance will repay any money because they're insured up to a certain amount of money. So that's the tricky and kind of, you know, interesting perspective is like, now you're in the driver's seat. Now you have to take care of your own security and security will only get better and easier over time. It's a little bit clunky right now because we have to think of, we're at the beginning, the 1990s of the internet, right? We're recreating all these new systems and we need to make it as secure as possible, but as easy for the users as possible. So there's definitely a bit of like, training and onboarding that people are kind of going through. And that's why where I think we're at right now is that's why we're having these sessions, right? To help people understand like your security and your um, what you're doing on online, what you're doing with your tokens and your currencies is, is really important. Uh, where you expose your computer to is, is really important. What links you click on are really important. That's why my mom has a virus on her computer every like six months. I'm like, you have to stop clicking on those ads on Google because they're just going to take you to places that they don't provide any value so rachel yeah i just wanted to check in uh with all the new people to see if if they feel like they're understanding everything um or if they have any questions or if there's if everyone's familiar with coinbase or or those kinds of terms and then i'd love to hear from aaron too 
I think Dr. Tejas has his hand up. Yes, thank you. I am not very experienced in this field, first of all. So my knowledge is very limited. I may ask some silly question. I'm sorry. I'm I'm not I'm not sure whether the Coinbase, Kraken, and Binance is it a custodial or non-custodial? And I already have my some funds, my some coins in my Binance account. So does it mean that I have no access to my wallet? I just know that I have purchased some coins, but I have no idea where it is or how to get sure. my wallet or anything like that. Yeah, I can answer that. So um, did you say it's on Coinbase? That's where it is? Or it's, it's on Binance. Binance? Binance, yeah. So Binance is a custodial wallet. So you'll never be able to access your private keys on Binance because they don't allow users to export their private keys. Um, you can transfer, depending on your country, your region, and the specifications in that region, you can transfer your tokens from Binance to MetaMask once you have a MetaMask wallet set up. So you have to just log in regularly like you would, um, make sure that you're in your account, and then any tokens that are Ethereum-based tokens, that's very specific, right? Because you could buy Binance chain, you could buy Bitcoin chain, like all of the blockchains are different chains. Ethereum is my favorite blockchain, doesn't have to be yours, but because you can use and you can operate all of your tokens under your MetaMask wallet, which is an Ethereum-based wallet, you can move any ERC-20 tokens, which is just a token standard from Binance, which is a custodial wallet, to your MetaMask wallet, which is a non-custodial wallet. So that shouldn't be that tricky unless, for some reason, since the time you've purchased your coins and now they change their policy, which is once again, a thing that happens only with custodial wallets. If a company changes their policy um, and they end up wanting to, or, or if they have to adhere to a local regulation or something like that, like in some countries, I think there were some tokens in the US that were like, hey, they were deemed securities. And so you no longer can trade them in the US. And so anyone who had those tokens on their exchange on Binance, were basically locked out of their account, which did happen, has happened, and is not cool, right? You're like, hey, I've got uh, $1,000 here and I wanna get that money out into something so I can pay my rent or whatnot. Well, they're not gonna help you do that because they're like, sorry, we have millions of people using our exchange and like you're at the bottom of our priorities lists. So having your own exchange, I mean, your own wallet that you can use makes uh, the most sense. Um, you can also do that with most other currencies you can host your own wallet but they're very depending on what blockchain you're using basically i hope that answers your question thank you very much and somebody let's say hack into the account of binance does it mean that i lose my coin potentially it doesn't mean always that you will lose your tokens but you could potentially lose your coins because however their data structuring is whether they like break it off into little clusters and they store it under some firewalls or whether it's all pooled together in one kind of, um, one kind of wallet. Uh, I think there was a, was it an Australian exchange that was hacked? I think maybe it was Mt. Gox, but it's like basically one, the owner of an exchange died. He had all of the funds in his personal wallet, right? In these hardware wallets. And then he never gave anyone secondary backup access to the, to, to the accounts. So all of the users that had made deposits into that exchange, those deposits were locked forever in that account that no one can ever get into because, hey, it's cryptographically secured, right? You don't want people to get in there. But because of the irresponsibility of one person, which I think is like kind of what this always comes back to, right? It's like the responsibility lies with the people and you want to be, you should be the most trusted authority for your funds. That's how I would want it specifically. Or maybe in the future, there are individuals who have a high level of trust in the network and there's some way that we can empower them to steward our funds. Um, that's like maybe crypto banks of some sort, right? Where it's like, these are trusted institutions. These are good players in the game and they're going to do operational security for my tokens. I trust them. And maybe there's some stake. So if like something bad happens with my tokens, their, their stake is slashed basically. And there, that could be a job in and of itself, right? Like doing cybersecurity for your own community. Now, now it's got my brain thinking, right? My brain moving. Uh, Aaron, I know you have some strong thoughts on this. Um, if this is interesting Absolutely. to people, maybe we can keep chatting about it a little bit. Absolutely. Um, 
thank you everyone. I think this is very important and I'm starting to get my head around the best way to present this to um, a less experienced audience. And I probably jump too far into it. As you can see in my doc, I get into some different things and, I, and I'll go through the points uh, one by one, but I won't spend too much time because there's a lot of points there. But I think everything that's here, if you are interested, if you do plan to spend time in the space, do things, send coins around, more or less, uh, some of the some of the things are, let's say, a little bit less important. But things like number one, a VPN, it's very important both at home and in public to have some sort of VPN service. If you don't. It's much more likely that someone is sitting there and looking at everything that's on your screen, taking all of your keystrokes, seeing all of your credit cards being passed back and forth, uh, or worse. And so uh, Proton VPN, I bought over their Christmas holiday. Um, actually, it was in November, it was even before it. They had a 50% off sale. I highly recommend them because it also gives you Aaron, real quick, back up. What is VPN? What do those yes. words mean? Oh, do I know the acronym? That's This is a good test. VPN is Virtual Private Network, right? Which essentially means, how can I put it in the best layman's terms? When you're on your home Wi-Fi network, let's say you don't set a password, right? Anyone can connect to your network, use your bandwidth, whatnot. The step above that is you set a password. I love dogs. Okay, there's one level. It's a, it's a picket fence and anyone can jump it. Let's say you set a very long 64 character random string. Okay, now it's a brick wall that's like seven feet high. It's going to take people time. They're going to have to set up a ladder. They're going to have to have somebody boost them over. They're probably going to avoid trying too hard to get into your system but it's just a brick wall and to some people brick walls are, are enough and you just hop right over them, right so then we get into um and we might be missing a step but i think after that is vpn um let's say someone does figure out your very complicated password now once again they are into and what happens is, and probably most of you are aware, they there are algorithms that are just running known passwords. Sometimes, sometimes they can match things to you. But one way or another, if they get in, they see everything, they have all your keystrokes. A VPN creates an extra layer of security. Let's say you're at Starbucks. Let's say you're, you're anywhere. If you have a VPN set up on your local machine, even if someone has access to the Wi-Fi network you are on, they will not be able to see the information that's being passed back and forth. I th I know I'm do I'm butchering this a little bit to the more technical crowd, but um, for no, I the, think I think that's good. Yeah, it's about it's, it's about security. Um, it creates a layer that even if that Wi-Fi network that you are on has been hacked or compromised, you are still probably going to be okay if your VPN is um, is running. So. Going from that to Proton Mail, that's another service from the Proton folks in Switzerland. Uh, it's encrypted. Every email is encrypted. The connections are much more secure than Gmail. They do not um, gather all the other information that's going on um, surrounding you and selling it. Um, yeah, it's so, a it's a paid email service, and like the benefits of yes. having a paid email service are you know numerous because. I, I don't know if you guys have ever seen, but like when you have a Google email address, like they are recommending you things based on what the text is in your email. So they are reading your emails and then they are recommending ads and things to you that you're like, oh, uh, how did you know I wanted that? Or I was talking about that because they're reading your email. Like you give them permission to read your email because you're taking care of a, you're taking part in a free service. And when you sign up, when you click the terms of service, they say we can do all these things in legal jargon and then they just go ahead and start to, to, to do that, right? And that's why paying for things like email makes a lot of sense because you're like, oh, if I want this to be private and like my own, then that, that, that makes sense. Um, I also really like Proton because you can encrypt a message. You can double or you can set a password on a message very easily. 
Uh, so if you're sending, if somebody's sending you their Ethereum address or you're sending your Ethereum address to someone, you might want to set up another password on top of it and then let let that person know who's receiving it, what that password is, so that if somebody happens to open it, that email when their laptop is open, now they have your Ethereum address, right? Um, Proton Mail does allow uh, for to create a free account with less uh, features. I tend to, ooh, this is bad OPSEC. I'm going to tell you how what I do. I tend to create a new Proton Mail account for anything, especially if I don't need it tied back or I don't want it tied back to me. Uh, jumping down the list down there, I have one password, which arguably is much, much, much less secure and sort of undoes every, uh, undoes everything that I am talking about here because one password stores everything in the cloud and they're not your servers. So if they get pwned, well, you sort of just gave everything to them, didn't you? It's, it's, this, it's the centralization problem all over again. So like there are services that kind of like do, do it more secure. And then there are services that just like, they say, we're going to do your security for you. And then they put all that information together. And if that security happens to be hacked, that one firewall is moved through, then everyone who, was give, who had their information in there is screwed. This happened with um, Ledger, which is a hardware wallet company. They had all of the information of the users who purchased Ledger wallets, which are these little hardware USB sticks. And so all of the hackers who got the information, they just started calling, emailing, and like threatening the people who had these Ledger wallets because they knew that basically these people have cryptocurrency. And so they, they made a lot of threats and they said things like, hey, we're going to come to your house. We know your address. Um, we're going to like maybe do bad things to you and your family. Um, because that information was not secured in a way that was like really well done, really legit. It wasn't as secured as Ethereum, right? It was stored on a mail that, server. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the the specific vulnerability was the Shopify list that Ledger was using as the Shopify database. The and I just as a point, I, I still use Ledger. Um, the security of their wallets themselves was not compromised, not the private key creation or being able to access it or anything. But what they did mess up on was using Shopify, who has a centralized database, who every user that at, to a certain point, because I bought most of mine back. So I, I, I received no threats because uh, I bought most of mine last year long enough before. But anyone that bought a ledger, let's say from September of last year on did get their email and some of their wherever they were shipped those ledgers were shipped which is a terrible terrible like how could they do this it's terrible why were they using shopify okay because they were saving money okay but i hope that ledger i hope nobody got pwned uh they're adjusting get pwned and certainly that didn't receive any letters but things like ledgers things like treasures you need them and if you don't trust ledger anymore because of this i understand use treasure you have to use some sort of hardware wallet and if you need to ship it to a P.O. box that your cousin is going to pick it up for you, maybe you do something like that. And somewhere way down uh, on this list I have, uh, you cannot afford to ignore security. And it's true because it's it very takes true. one time. Yeah. It takes one time and I've had – I mean I, I'm not going to go through it. But I and, – and this extends into things like DeFi that I, we don't even cover. When you're accepting permissions or um, allowing a contract, to have permissions on your wallet. Maybe this is a 105 topic. Yeah, yeah, it you might be a little be bit advanced. About what you're doing, permissions and, and people getting into your wallet. So treat everything like it's a Cobra for now, especially if you're new, but don't be afraid. And that's sort of that, that well, it's like uh, double check and then boldly go forward because down there on the bottom too, you are capable of understanding this. It doesn't matter how old you are. I have seen my father who's in his mid sixties go from completely not understanding and you know, and not even, you know, wanting to, but not wanting to, you know, that kind of thing, to we went deep on crypto kitty breeding and how he might be able to take advantage of uh of such a of such things since crypto kitties are low right now. So, you know, it, it it you can get all of this and you can get all of this much much further in advanced um oh there he is my dad's here there he is realize. he's down at the bottom <laughs> welcome yan so um hide your home wi-fi network 
You're going to need to do your own research on that. It's not difficult. Your provider has instructions on whoever it is, has instructions on their website. You have to do it. Do not let your home Wi-Fi network be accessed by anybody with a phone or a sniffer. That's just, or a sniffer will still get you, but at least if I open up my phone right now, I'm going to see everyone's Wi-Fi network in my apartment, except my own, because it's yeah, it. It's just a simple setting. Yeah, uh, education. Cash. Education is, is really important. Let's not go into tornado cash yet. Okay, that's probably uh, way higher. Okay, then I am yeah. I, I'm done. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Aaron. The platform, everyone. Um, yeah, I maybe it went over my head a little bit, but um, just talking about hardware wallets and why they're important, and then also just um, like knowing that something's secure or like not downloading something <laughs> unless you know i don't know I, I don't know if you understand what i'm trying to ask or say but it's like how do you know if something's legit how do you figure that out i don't really know the point of, of a hardware wallet so maybe you can and maybe i missed that maybe I, you said I it go, no no we, yeah, we, you we can, take it? yeah yeah we can totally touch on that so Hardware wallets are physical pieces of machinery. It looks like a USB stick. Passlar is holding one there. Passlar, can you show us your password for that too? Just kidding. It's a joke. Just need your um, pin, pin number, please. Just your pin number. Um, so that is a physical device that takes your cryptocurrency offline. So once this currency is stored onto, oh, that's that's not a hardware wallet. That's another one. <laughs> that's a different kind. Of, um, so once it's offline, it's stored there for you. And um, you can access, move your tokens around back online when you plug it in, but only when you plug it in. And you want to make sure you're plugging it into a website that you trust or a wallet service provider that you trust. Um, how do you figure out if you trust something or not? Well, um, you read the reviews, right? How do you buy something and you know it's good? You basically have to look at wherever you're getting the software from and make sure that like it is the official, like real software that it's verified because the the there has been instances of clones of websites that people um, make copies of those websites and they end up um, changing one letter in it or something like that. So you have to be really careful of, with these kind of things and make sure that you're like you're always on the right website and that when you have the link to the application that you download the application onto your computer from the official source and that's usually like verified on the app store or on. Um, what's the the android like the play store so depending on what operating system that you have you can download it and once it's in your computer you're not using the desktop version of it it's safe and it won't be corrupted in that sense but the 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 additional benefits of the differences between a software wallet like a metamask wallet the one i just showed is that's just a piece of software that lives in your computer it's a few lines of code you can use that to move your coins around or just to hold them there as well but if your computer is corrupted, if you download a piece of malware to your computer, someone might be able to, like Aaron said, get access to your wallet by looking at your keystrokes. And that's like a crazy new piece of technology that potentially is like they're listening for what the typing noise is being made on your computer and they can reconstitute your password from that. So it's kind of scary, but also like these things can really happen. Um, and with this hardware wallet, that's not possible because your tokens are offline. They're in a, what's called cold storage, basically. So it's like the three levels of security, right? A Coinbase wallet is the least secure wallet you can have. A MetaMask, a MetaMask wallet is the more secure, right? Medium security. A hardware wallet is the most maximum security that you can have. And so as you go through the process and you're onboarding yourself in different stages, you can figure out what level of security is good for you. And I do recommend for everyone to get a hardware wallet at some point in time, especially if you're like, hey, I have a good amount of money in here, like maybe over $10,000. And I don't want to see anything happen to that. Um, it's just a good safety protocol. It's like maybe a hundred bucks to get one, maybe less if you get a discount. And then you have that, that's your little bank that you can take with you. Uh, Pasar, did you have something? Uh, I just wanted to mention the fact that it's not always someone trying to steal your money or hack into your system. Uh, a friend of mine just lost about $15,000 because he was updating his laptop 
and then some weird thing happened to his browser and then now his, his MetaMask is not working properly. And the same problem has happened to his seed phrase that he had mistakenly saved on the same laptop. And now he, he doesn't have access. And uh, you, you need to understand that unlike the traditional banking system where when you make a mistake and you lose your password or something happens to your account, you go there with your ID and say, this is me, I own this account, please bring it back for me, recover it, fix this problem for me. Now there is no central authority that you would go there and say, I lost my seed phrase, do something, fix my MetaMask, fix this, or I, I made a mistake. If you lose it, you lose it forever. There is no one to help you. No one has access to your account. And that's that's the, 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 the main point of having a decentralized uh, the, the system of uh, the, the currencies. Yep, totally makes sense. Rachel? Yeah, I just wanted to check in with everyone. I saw, I think the doctor had a question, but just seeing where everyone is with the information, if there's any questions up to this point. Um, but yeah, I can go ahead to the doctor. Yeah, do you own a hardware wallet yet? Okay, so first step is buy one. You have to buy a hardware wallet. And then once you buy one, it's the same process as transferring tokens. So you'll use an application like MetaMask or the Ledger Live if you're using a Ledger, and you'll be able to install that piece of software into your computer. It'll give you a little dashboard that you can look, and then you can copy your address. You can go from the Ledger Live application to your Binance exchange account, and you can enter that address and say, oh, okay, um, I want to send these tokens from this exchange to this address, and it'll send from the website to your hardware wallet automatically, and they'll be stored there. Thank you. Yep. I have a question. Yes. Uh, I bought my ledger <clears throat> hardware. I bought my my ledger uh, from Amazon. Is that a risk, or should I have just bought from Ledger.com? Yeah, there's definitely a risk um, because Amazon sellers are not like verified resellers of these kind of things. If anyone for any reason like took that hardware wallet, if they had control of the hardware wallet and they were able to plug it into their computer, they could have taken the private seed phrase from that and then sealed it back up, wrapped it in plastic and then sent it out to you. And as soon as you load your tokens on there, they could drain the funds automatically. So the best way to go, and I'm not saying that did happen, but the best way to go is to buy directly from the company um, that is selling them, Ledger, Tracer, these kind of places. Which was exactly my worry. So even though I haven't even touched that piece of equipment yet, the second that I grab it and stick it into my computer or connect it to my phone, I could potentially be risking my funds at that point. It's only once you transfer funds to that hardware wallet, right? So it doesn't have right. any, there's no way for it to have any malicious code or anything like that because uh, ledgers are not designed like that. But there is a potential okay. that someone could have the seed phrase of that hardware wallet. And as soon as you plug it in and you transfer funds to that address, they already have the private keys. They're already looking and monitoring for transactions. As soon as the funds land, they could actually have a notification set up on Etherscan. They could see the funds are in there and they could drain the funds instantly. So that would be a bad time. If you if you still have it and you haven't opened it, just send it back to them. Just return it. Yeah, it hasn't. It actually hasn't arrived because on Ledger they were out of stock, and on Amazon they were also out of stock. So I figured that Amazon would get me the Ledger quicker than Ledger Company itself, which is the only reason I went through Amazon is trying to get it in my hands a little bit faster. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, I mean, Aaron, I don't know if you have a differing, differing opinion on upon this, but um, in, in my thought, it's like buy from the company directly, even if you have to wait. Aaron, Amazon's website, they say that they get it from, the, the seller is Ledger. Like they're, they're acquiring that equipment from Ledger itself. But again, that's, I've heard that exactly what you just said that sometimes amazon gets you know the same thing that they it's listed from a certain seller and you end up getting a uh the, the other the other like kind of scary thing about that is so 
if these things are made in China, which they probably are, right? Because that's where most electronics are manufactured. If there is one malicious seller that's just recreating everything, and then Amazon happens to buy in bulk from one of those sellers, um, like then a whole scheme of people could be looped into that where like they are selling 10,000 of them, but they've all been corrupted. Uh, A small note, and it may be number one for sure, buy direct from whoever it is. And Ledger isn't really motivated to sell to a middleman or a third party um, for a number of reasons, unless they're logistic. Oh, well, we, we... they shouldn't be motivated to sell to a third party. If you do receive from a third party, or if you have it, best case scenario, try to get another one. However, the way a hardware wallet works. Yeah, I you, haven't, I haven't received it yet. So I guess I'll just yeah, return no. it to Amazon and order from Legend. Hopefully and they'll, they'll take it. A few more days. But if you. Uh, if they won't take it back, you can play with it. It'll educate you. Just don't send anything to it. Because when you set up your account on a Ledger wallet, that those private keys are generated right then. So let's say somebody took, you know, in, in this case, they took the Ledger wallet. And, man, I, I almost hesitate to go here. <clears throat> I do. You know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to backpedal. I agree. If you, because I don't want to get into this kind of no reason to. I agree buy directly if you haven't tried to return it i would not trust sending anything to it uh, i wanted to get into why and details but i'm not going to just just don't do it <laughs> yeah it says it's two weeks to ship right now from ledger.com so that's not a crazy right. long amount of time right. yeah I, I better safe than question. sorry right uh, go ahead yeah i have one more question i have some coins staked on crypto.com do they hold responsibility while your coins are staked? Like if they were to get hacked and could they say, oh, even though your coins are staked and, and we're holding them and, you know, I guess using your coins, we got hacked and your funds are gone and we can't reimburse you. Do you guys, can you fill me in on that? So as far as I'm concerned, you probably signed into terms and service with crypto.com because they're a centralized service. Uh, yeah. if they're hacked, like they're likely not liable for reimbursing you for, for what's staked on there. I don't know how the staking mechanism actually works on crypto.com. I've never used it. I have only ever used like decentralized staking services like Yam or Pickle or like some of these crazier DeFi projects, which I know you don't get your funds back if they happen to be hacked. But my, my assumption would be, without reading terms and service, that crypto.com is not liable for any loss of funds that happens if they're hacked. Okay. Also, I just want to clarify this point as well. If any of you folks here are getting into like ICOs or you're like looking for token airdrops, if you go through an exchange account like a Binance, like a Coinbase you cannot use that address for any of those services, for any of those things like contributing to an ICO or buying an ENS, like Ethereum name service, because those types of wallets don't accept those extra functions. So I, this just happened on Twitter like two weeks ago. There's a rapper named Soldier Boy. And one of uh, the people from Ethereum was like, hey, I own your ENS name. It's an Ethereum naming service. So in my example, Yaler.eth, you can send funds to Yaler.eth and that will route it directly to my wallet address. So you can set one of those up for yourself. You know, you can be Paslar.eth or Rachel.eth or Kirch.eth. And that way you can have people save. Uh, it's a really just a short thing. So it's just like Yaler.eth instead of what's my whole 17 string uh, wallet address. But if you send it to a Coinbase account, it's basically lost because they don't uh, accept those functionalities. So anyway, so the, one of the people from the Ethereum community said to Soldier Boy, hey, I want to send you your Ethereum address. I want to send you your, your ETH name because I bought it for you a while back. And he said, great. So he posted his address. He sent it along. And he says, uh, I don't see it. It's not showing up in my Coinbase account. And he said, oh, no, you can't, you can't send it to a Coinbase account because you don't own the keys. So it won't allow you to uh, access that 
the Ethereum name. So basically now they have to go through this whole process of kind of trying to contact Coinbase, which is a massive multi-million dollar organization that has no time for dealing with like customer requests. If you've ever been on their uh, FAQs, you'd, you'll see that they're not very hands-on. Anyway, Rachel. Um, we just have about 10 minutes left. I have two questions. If you could go over what staking is, and then if we finished setting up a wallet, I'm not sure if we got through all the steps of that. We could do that for everyone before we close up. Yeah, sure. So staking is when you have tokens and you lock them up to get some benefit, basically. Um, it's like an interest rate on money. So if you're like, hey, like, it's interesting. Like, I think of it like banks are staking on people, right? And we're staking on like cryptocurrencies. So like the bank gets a 5% back if they give you $10,000. Well, with um, pro projects like Balancer, Uniswap, uh, like YAM, like all of these kind of uh, token mechanism communities, you're able to take your tokens like Ethereum or like DAI and you're able to stake them into a smart contract. That basically just means you click a few buttons and then your tokens are held there in that contract. And depending on what it's designed to do, for example, Balancer is designed to buy and sell between ETH and Balancer tokens. And so they have access to make exchanges on your behalf and then they mint tokens for you that then pay you an interest rate. So you can range anywhere from five to 500% depending on the level of risk that you're in. There's a bunch I've seen 80,000. I've seen 80,000%. Yeah. And that probably 80,000%. Thank you. That, that lasts for maybe a few minutes. I don't know. Like, but like, it's, it's interesting. Right. And that's how people are making money at this point in time. They're taking the tokens they have, they're locking them up for staking. Um, but you can also do other interesting things. You can stake your tokens for communities. You can stake your tokens for matching. You can stake your tokens for voting. Um, and so there's many use cases for staking, but it's, uh, it's the number one right now is financial incentive. Like you find the highest yield for your tokens to be staked. And then you take however many tokens you have and you lock them up there until you decide that you want to pull them out or do something different with them. But if you can find a really good uh, interest rate, like say 80%, if you put $10,000 in, that gives you $8,000 over the course of a year, which is higher than any bank I've ever heard of um, just for letting your money sit there basically. I hope that answers your question. Um, and then, yes, so the last piece of MetaMask. Did anyone actually click and download MetaMask? Um, no, I'm on my phone. Okay, so on your phone, there is a MetaMask application in the App Store in Google Play as well. You can do that as well. But once again, make sure you save your seed phrase once you do, or just do it when you get home. Um, they have pretty nice instructions of how to set it up on their website alone. I like MetaMask because it's simple. It's one of the first wallets around and they have a really good kind of like user flow of setting it up. It's pretty easy. Um, but yeah, you can do it on your phone. I would say the mobile application is not as good as the web application. So just something to keep in mind, but it is nice sometimes to have your wallets backed up on your phone in case something happens to your computer. But I, I seriously, I can't say enough good things about setting up your own wallet. Like make sure you have your own non-custodial wallet that you can put your tokens in, that you can play with because there's so many more avenues for doing interesting things in Ethereum, especially if you have this wallet, this MetaMask wallet. I think of it like your passport to Web3. A Coinbase account is like this hybrid of like, okay, there's traditional finance. And then there's like giving you some exposure to web three and cryptocurrencies. And then there's like MetaMask, which is like, you can go anywhere on Ethereum with a MetaMask account because it is a web three provider and it's communicating between your wallet and those different services. And a lot of those services are decentralized exchanges or decentralized pro projects that they don't, like some of them don't even have a legal entity behind them. It's just a community that built this project. A lot of them are in Switzerland or in more friendly like um, uh, regions basically for cryptocurrencies, because as we know, like the US is not one of the friendliest regions for cryptocurrencies. Um, other countries are also like putting a little bit of like pressure, but I generally tend to think it's going in, in the right direction. Like we're gonna see a lot more adoption 
as we see like enterprise Ethereum get adopted globally. So yeah, um, Rachel? Yeah, um, is any last questions uh, for clarity or anything like that for, for everyone? I, I, I have one more question if, if, uh, if there's some time. Can you take Bitcoin that's on Kraken.com and put it on MetaMask or is Bitcoin separate because it's not using the Ethereum blockchain? Yeah, correct. Aaron, I think you're, I don't know if you're speaking to me or to your computer, but I see I was just waving. I was wagging my finger. Don't, don't send Bitcoin to MetaMask. Yeah. Okay, cool. So yeah, okay. what you can do is you can buy W Bitcoin, which is wrapped Bitcoin on Ethereum. And then you can save that in your MetaMask wallet. Um, but yeah, if you have Bitcoin now, you can't send Bitcoin to Ethereum because they're two different blockchains. It's like trying to deposit euros in my United States bank account. It does not compute, right? They're like, no, we don't, we don't do that. So the, if you want to use a MetaMask wallet, um, you can get access to so many different tokens on Ethereum exclusively, and Bitcoin's one of them because they've created this wrapped Bitcoin contract. It basically is, it has a, re a reserve of Bitcoin. So anyone that deposits uh, funds into the wrapped Bitcoin, it'll match the price of Bitcoin. So wrapped Bitcoin is the same price as regular Bitcoin, and you can always sell it as such on the Ethereum blockchain. And also you can do other things with it, like go to badger.finance um, and stake it. That's a little bit okay. complicated, but so on on Kraken, I would I would trade from regular Bitcoin to wrapped Bitcoin on Kraken.com and then put it into my MetaMask. If it's listed, if it's listed, you can definitely do that. If not, okay. then what you're gonna want to do is go from Bitcoin to Ethereum and then go move your Ethereum to MetaMask, and then you can swap okay. Ethereum for wrapped Bitcoin on Uniswap on Paraswap, on any of those exchange services that offer wrapped Bitcoin. Okay. Okay. It's not, it's not it's complicated. Kyle? Yeah, I want to talk about a couple different things. Um, a really important thing when you're uh, using crypto is to make sure that you're getting the right web page. Uh, if we want to talk about security, um, there's been phishing attacks where websites look like Uniswap and they're not actually Uniswap and you just send your crypto to someone else. So it's very important to use, and, and I'm just gonna base, basically what I do is I use CoinGecko and I search for the coin that I'm looking for and then I'll use that website that they have posted on CoinGecko. And that's just a kind of a safe keep that you don't get phished or anything like that. And then also I wanna touch a point on if you're using your phone um, and this might not, to apply, might not apply to a lot of people, but uh, there has been like SIM swapping attacks where people have drained crypto if you are using SIM cards uh, when you're traveling. So just be careful with what you're doing on your phone and make sure that you know things are backed up or you know if someone got a, a hold of your phone, they wouldn't be able to just send your money out of your MetaMask. Yep, super relevant. Um, was there another question? Oh. Someone started, but stopped. I, I'm sorry. I feel like I'm hogging all the. No, uh, hey, I think it's fine. I, no, it's fine. I, okay. So it, someone would actually have to take your SIM card out of your phone and, and then put it into their own, is what he was talking about. No, Just no. So a SIM swap is actually done by accessing the mobile provider. Once again, this comes back to centralization. If someone has all of your information, they can call up T Mobile and they can say, Hey, I'm Zachary. I have my birth date, my social security number, and I, I have my password if they get that somehow, right? And they can say, I want to change the SIM in my phone. And what they do is they order a SIM under your account and then they put it into their phone and they're able to load up your account onto their phone. And basically they can take control of your service. So they can take they can take whatever applications you've got booted up into the cloud. They can load that up on their phone and then they can access it, which um, has happened before. It's a really extreme case, I think but it has happened before, especially with people who have a lot of funds, they're like targets for that. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of ways that hackers use to get into 
into things. Um, yeah, so I think that brings us to the top of the hour. Um, Rachel, any last uh, points? Yeah, I just want to thank everyone for coming again. I'm going to send you a recording and I'll put also the chat in the email too, which will have all the links that everyone provided. Um, so if you didn't get a chance to make tabs or write them down, uh, you'll get them in the email I'll send later today. Um, and if anyone um, has more questions or ideas for what next you want to learn, yes, yeah, Stephanie, go ahead. You are muted. Unmute yourself. Hi. Hello. Yeah, I was hearing about these, uh, all these worries about phones and VPNs, and I just found out, and I'm using this phone that is called Copperhead. I recommend looking into it. And then um, these guys are doing like nice stuff on privacy and protecting data and like sandboxing uh, apps, and you can have various accounts. And it's like completely, uh, got rid of um, Google inside the phone. So it's it's kind of amazing because a lot of the phishing does happen because one app is like taking from another app. So because they sandbox them, it's just amazing. And another little thing I have is like, a, it's a called um, uh, Box. Sorry, I, I forgot the name now. It's like a travel VPN box that you can connect to every Wi-Fi you go to, which is amazing because it also hides your MAC address of every device you're using. So it's like a VPN on the go, and it's as well as like um, hiding your, all your machines that you're connecting to. So that's it's awesome. I, I've been looking for a better phone service. So that looks like a really cool one. I dropped the link for people in the chat. And the, the other box, I'm sorry, I'm not finding the name now, but it's um, fuck because I know I have it at home. They have anyways i'll share it later on I'm happy to share that awesome thanks yeah. for the sharing the information yeah um well yeah good to see everyone and thanks for um tuning in and if you guys do have questions if some of you are still confused about setting up a wallet you can message me on telegram my username is yaler Mune, and i'm happy to like answer questions but just download metamask give it a shot and um you know, see if you can get it up and running on your computer and then you can start uh, clicking around and uh, having Ethereum fun. That is all. Farewell. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, <laughs> Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Appreciate, appreciate you guys. <laughs>